Good, singing together. I invite you to open up your Bibles initially tonight to Psalm 62 as we continue our journey through some various life lessons, right? Growing through uh, times that we wouldn't necessarily choose. We wouldn't choose to be misunderstood. We wouldn't choose to having to be waiting. We wouldn't choose to be going through times of stress and anxiety. Tonight we're dealing with impossibilities, times that of impossibilities in our lives. I've, I've been looking forward, I don't know whether I'll, yeah, I think I'll be able to see it, or I don't know if I had to tape it. But tomorrow night, they've been advertising it enough, right? But you know what's on tomorrow night? The Sound of Music live, right? And um, Carrie Underwood. And, um, and of course in that, there's some of those songs that are, you know, that just kind of, you know, get you, get you revved up to go attack your impossibilities, right? I have confidence in confidence alone, Maria sings, right? Besides which you see, I have confidence in me, she says. Not in me, in herself, right? And then later, of course, there's that moving song where Mother Superior, whoever, sis sings, climb every mountain, ford every stream, Follow every rainbow till you find your dream. And they're wonderful. They're uplifting and they're stirring. They remind me of when I was a kid listening to dream, the impossible dream, right? That, 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 and, and that song, right? To, to, that, and the world will be better for this. That one man, scorned and covered with scars, still strove with his last ounce of courage to reach the unreachable star. And of course, tonight, that means we're going to be talking about impossibilities that as long as we just set our mind to it, we can accomplish anything, right? Wrong. <laughs> Wrong. Because in real life, I cannot reach the unreachable star. That's why we call it unreachable, right? You know, we have enough messengers out there who want to kind of, and, and as I've said before, I understand. We want to build someone's sense of, uh, you, you know, encouragement and confidence, and, but it built ultimately on the right foundation because in real life, I will face impossibilities. There are things I cannot will myself to. Let alone reaching the unreachable star, I can't will myself to victory over death. I can't will and just see my, you know, I, I, I can't just by bringing enough energy change my circumstances all the time. As a matter of fact, in Psalm 62, we read what? We read a verse that I remember reading it for the first time and being like, wow. Psalm 62, verse 11. Once God has spoken, twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God. Power belongs to God. And tonight we're going to be looking at impossibilities as as we face them. And obviously there are times where we refer to something as an impossibility and it's, it's not an impossibility. Our child may say, it's impossible. No matter how hard I study, I'm not going to get an A. And, you know, I, I, I don't know. But I mean, we, the, the, the reality is they, they perhaps could, you know, get that you know, in a certain situation with enough studying or, you know. But we're dealing with some things in life that we can't change. We can't change. We face certain things that are outside of the realm of us just saying, I'm going to strap this on my back and, and, and turn everything around. 
What do we do with impossibilities? Well, power belongs to God. And one of the things that God will see clearly allows us to face some of these situations that stand in front of us is because He wants us to see how different He is than us. How we will face impossibilities, but what may be impossible for us is not necessarily impossible for him. Not, what, what I say necessarily is not impossible for him. God makes a very clear declaration. He wants us to know. If you turn to Jeremiah 32, God wants to declare through the prophet that he is absolutely different than us. In Jeremiah chapter 32, Jeremiah chapter 32 and verse 17, we hear this. Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you. It's written there in the Hebrew in the strongest possible way, in the, in, in the strongest negative. Uh, one translator, one writer says we could almost say it like this. No, nothing, absolutely nothing is surpassing you, Lord, is, is too difficult for you, Lord. It is set up there with a very strong with, with the, the negative in the beginning of the sentence, nothing too strong for you. As Jeremiah shouts it out, he's obviously making a statement. If Jeremiah felt like all of us had the ability in us, if we really just dug deep enough, if we really just had the resolve, you know, to chew up life and spit it out and do it our way, right? If we all of us could accomplish whatever we set our mind to, no, no. I, I don't believe, even at the height of my athletic state, at my greatest point of athleticism, I don't believe there's a trainer in this world who could have made me able to dunk a basketball at a regulation basket. I really don't believe it. Now, I've dunked basketballs before, but I dunked them by jumping off the picnic bench and then off the picnic table, then dunked it. It just was a long way down in our backyard, and I can remember that sense of, you know, but, 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 but what my point is, it's impossibility. If, you know, it just, it's just an impossibility that to be able to, for me, to do that. Jeremiah knows there's things that are impossible for each of us and for all of us. But what does he say? No, nothing, absolutely nothing is too difficult for you, God. And we've got to set our mind on that because God declares that. He brings us up sometimes to the impossibility and it may not be that he's going to do what you want him to do. But he's bringing you up to it for you to know this is, this is, look, you have limitations. You can't handle this. But I can. I can go beyond it. I can do all things. In Jeremiah chapter 32 later, we, what do we read in verse 27 and verse 26? Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too difficult for me? Jeremiah 32 27. Is anything too difficult for me? In my coaching with, um, I've, I've, you know, I coach sports and I've coached some on my own and I've had the opportunity to be coaching with Jeff Prentice, who we've prayed for in the past and God's been blessed, given him continued strength. His, every six months he gets scans. He, he was, if you remember, several years back was diagnosed with Stage four lymphoma, and God's put it in remission. He's doing great. But Jeff is a tremendous, tremendous basketball coach. Just as far as I'm concerned, the best basketball coach I've ever been around. And just knows how to teach, more, really knows how to teach 
a sport. And one of the things that he does that I never used to do, and I do a little bit now, having learned from him, he'll ask questions of the players. So he'll say, we're coaching the, the uh, uh, you know, girls varsity basketball, and he'll say, okay, so um, next week we're going to be playing against Atlantic, and you know they're going to be um, coming with their full court 1-3-1 one, one press. How are we going to defeat that press? And you'll see some... Uh, and, and, and they want to answer, but, they're, but they also don't want to be wrong, right? But they'll, he's trying to get them to think, right? And he'll, he'll say, anybody? Come on, how are we going? For me, my tendency would have been, I'm not asking you anything. Look, I'm telling you what we're going to do. Here's how we're going to do it. Now, the point is, he knows how we're going to defeat that press. And, and he's not going to change what we're going to do based on the girls' answers. But it, he, it's, it's neat because he makes them at least begin to think. Um, well, let's see, how, how would we go about, and sometimes he'll wait and say, what do you, how about you, what do you think, what, what, what's the key to defeating that press, and to draw them in, right, and that, that's, that's critical, to draw them in, to get them thinking, and what is it that God does, he asks a question, he says, is there anything that's too difficult for me? Are you asking me that? <laughs> you know, like, like what for us to think and be engaged and respond, right? I got, I had the, 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 the privilege of speaking at Miriam's school to the kids, and I've spoken before at other schools, and I've read in Christine's class, and with kids sometimes you ask them a question, oh, and you say yes, you. Oh. Like it's fascinating to me because I'm not a teacher; I'm just fascinated. Yeah, they either they they have no idea the answer. They just wanted to be called on. I don't know that, how, what age that eventually stops. But I'm fascinated. I'll say I'll ask a question. Oh, 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 and I'm thinking, oh, this kid knows. And I'll say, yes, you right there. I've spoken at your school, and it's happened. And they're kind of like, uh, uh, what was the question? Or, or <laughs> right? But but God says, is there anything that's too difficult for me? Well, Lord. And he's, and he's drawing us in. Why? Because I, God does uh, want us to face impossible situations to learn from them. But what he wants us to learn most about them is about our inability to just bowl them over, right? Our inability to just drive. You, we, you'll run into people out there who will say, you know, kind of motivational speakers, there, you, you, you know, if you just, you, there is a, a solution. There's not always a solution. There's not always a solution. One of the best, you know, uh, pieces of advice I think I've given to people sometimes, I don't mean like it's mine that I thought of it, is, hey, remember in this situation, the only person that you can change is you. You can't change them. You can do all, you can drive yourself crazy trying to change them. They may need to change, but you can't change them. You can only turn to God to change yourself. And so the, the, the God is letting us, drawing us in. Sometimes people might want to say to the Lord, well, you don't, you, you say, is there anything too difficult for you? You don't, you don't realize my situation, right? First off, he does, right? But I would say to you, if you said to me, you don't know my situation, I would say, I don't. But I don't need to know your situation. I know God. I know that nothing is too difficult for him. I know that. I don't know what he's going to do. I spoke last night at a very small funeral of a, a, a young husband and wife. You know, she was a week or two away from delivering their child, and she just sensed the baby wasn't moving anymore. And, and it wasn't, right? And as I sat there speaking to them, I said, I don't, I'm not here to tell you why God did that. I don't, I don't know why. I can tell you how God how, how much God loves you. I can tell you what he has promised 
I can tell you what it is that he wants you to know. He, there are things he doesn't allow us to know, which sometimes we don't know why this, at this moment, this time, but I can tell you what he does want you to know, that he loves you, that he's, and, 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 and speak to them about God's plan of uh, eternal life in heaven. Uh, I, I, you know, I don't know, I know God. I know what, what I know about God, and in possible situations, let me know some things about me that I can't do everything, but it also lets me know about God, that we have a God who's declared nothing's too difficult for me. Nothing. It's part of the Christmas story, right? When we turn to Luke chapter 1, in Luke chapter 1, when, the, when Gabriel comes and tells Mary of her body and what God is doing in her body, right, in Luke chapter 1 and in verse 34 of Luke 1, Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I am a virgin? It is impossible, she's saying, it is impossible for me to have a child. I have not been with a man. It's impossible. In verse 37, what does the angel say? Nothing will be impossible with God. Nothing will be impossible with God. Later in his life, what does Jesus declare in Luke chapter 18? Uh, that declaration in Luke chapter 18 and verse 27, he said, the things that are impossible with people are possible with God. We got to keep our eyes on God because there are some, you know, speakers sometimes that take that verse and by the time they're done speaking, they've kind of made it that whatever it is you want. God's going to make it possible for you to get that. And that's not what Jesus is saying. The things that are impossible with people are possible with God. But that's not saying whatever it is you want, you just trust God and you're going to get it because God can give you, God can do anything. There is nothing impossible for Him, but He allows us to journey through the impossibilities for us to see that. Lord, I can't, I can't make this happen. I can't force down this wall. I can't change that person. I can't do this. But I believe you can. I don't know what you will do, but I believe you can. Whether it's with my job or with my body or with my marriage or with whatever it may be, uh, there may be an impossibility I'm facing, but it's not impossible for you. And so we have that clear declaration. And then let's look at a clear display of it in John chapter 6. Because I love the way John chapter 6 unfolds because it's clear that Jesus is, when I say orchestrating these events, he, he's for the purpose of, of, of making the greatest impact on his disciples. The miracles, certainly miracles were performed by Jesus as a sign to identify who he was. They were clear, they were obvious, they were powerful signs identifying him. But often his miracles were done for the benefit of his followers. Jesus wasn't, as a matter of fact, there were times where those who were rejecting him, who were saying, show us a miracle. No, I, I'm not here to, to, you know, at your beckoning wish to, to do something to prove to you, you know, uh, because you don't believe in me. Often his miracles were, were for those with eyes to see. And in John chapter 6, he's making a tremendous impact on his disciples. Uh, we read in John chapter 6 and verse 1, after these things, and that is the disciples, we, if we threw a harmony of the Gospels, which we don't have the time to do tonight, tonight, the disciples have been out sharing and involved in ministry and, and proclaiming, 
you know, the good news and they're tired, they're weary. After these things, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. A large crowd followed him because they saw the signs which he was performing on those who were sick. Then Jesus went up on the mountain and there he sat down with his disciples. Ready to get some rest, right? And yet we read in verse 5, Therefore Jesus, lifting up his eyes and seeing that a large crowd was coming to him, he says to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? They're, they're worn out. We're going to see with this, you, you may read there in John chapter 6, Right in the beginning of the chapter, because we'll read it in here, about 5,000 fed. In Matthew's gospel, he refers to 5,000 men plus women and children. I mean, there, there could be a lot more than 5,000 here, right? But when we're, when we're seeing this and unfolding, it's an impossible situation. He looks, he sees the large crowd, they're hungry, it, they need to eat, and... He says to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? And this is a situation that Philip's looking at saying, uh, this is going to happen, right? My daughter Natalie called me right now. And I answered the phone and she said, Dad, I need you here in an hour. My mind will go, okay, what can I do? Nothing. There's no, I, I, there is no ability for me to get to Grove City in an hour. I don't have a chartered plane sitting out on, you know, already gassed and started. And, you know, you know it just, it's an impossible situation. And Philip's looking at that. Jesus is drawing the disciples into it for them to see every detail, right? He, 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 he wants them to be aware of it. He wants to know what is happening. And so he pulls Philip in. Kind of like, I mean, I'm adding words to it, and I know that, but all right, Philip, look at this situation. Get a good look. Look around. How are we going to, how is this, can this be solved? Is it possible to feed these people? And I think Jesus is wanting the disciples to get a real grip of the impossibility of this situation. To, to be able to, 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 to know it in and out. Really experience it. Because they're going to be proclaiming it for the rest of their lives, however long or short that may be. This is the only miracle that's recorded in all four of the Gospels. It's a significant miracle because John makes it clear that at the end of this miracle, in Jesus' talk about himself being the living bread, uh, there's, a, there's a lot who turn away, right? And yet it's, so it's for them to be seeing and remembering the details, Right? You know, it's, it's as we read John 6 and we're reading the details and how it's being set up and what's happening and the crowd's there. And it's, you, you know, it's one of those moments where, yeah, yeah, it's, you got to capture all of that. The sense of how on everybody's mind it was an impossible situation for you to be able to then, whew, I don't know how many of you, you know, when I say the miracle at the Meadowlands, what comes to your mind? It's a Philadelphia Eagles thing, and it still goes back to, you know, back at whatever it was, 1980 or whatever. I, don't, I forget the exact year. But when it was over, it was impossible, so to speak, for the Eagles to win. The game was done. All the Giants had to do. Joe Pisarczyk was hiked the ball and kneeled down. And yet for some reason, he tried to hand it off to Larry Zonka. Larry Zonka fumbles the ball. And Herman Edwards picks it up and runs for a touchdown. And the Eagles won. And whenever they show that, they don't just show it. No, they talk. You hear Merle Reese, you know, go, well, this will be it for the Eagles. You know, and, then that, and they set the scene because you have to have the scene set to realize what an amazing turnaround this was. God is setting the scene. Jesus is setting the scene. Philip, is this an impossible situation? 
You know, he, he, he's, he wants the disciples after the miracle, as they're talking about it to people weeks and months and years later, for them to remember how their stomachs felt hungry and how tired their bodies were and how many people and how impossible a situation it was. And he questions Philip, like God saying, is anything too difficult for me? Jesus says, Philip, where are we to buy bread? And, and, and John tells us in verse 6, this he was saying to test him. For he himself knew that he was what he was intending to do. This obviously isn't Jesus saying. Did anybody? Are, was there a Del Bonos around here anywhere? Did anybody? You know, there was, was. This clearly wasn't Jesus looking for an answer. He's testing him. I would imagine he's wanting to see if Philip turns to him and says, "Lord, <laughs> I'm not even going to think about it because I, it's a, it's an impossibility." Except for the fact that you're here. You being here changes that. But that's not what Philip says, right? Philip just calculates and says, impossible. Impossible. We don't have nearly enough money to be able to feed this group. That's the solution Philip looks toward. Next is Andrew, because what happens uh, in verse 7, Philip answered, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, for everyone to receive a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are these for so many people? Now, like one writer says, oh, wouldn't it have been so much better for Andrew if he had stopped after he just mentioned you know, how, how much better for Andrew, right, if he had said, well, there's a lad here with some loaves of bread and fish. It's like you, you, you've seen that commercial, those creative commercials, and right, uh, old McDonald at the spelling bee. Your word is cow. C-O-W-E-I-E-I-O. -E -E Wrong. Dag, damn it. You know, and he, he kind of walks off, right, you know. You know, but, but if he had just stopped at C-O-W and kept off the E-I-E-I-O, he'd still be in the spelling bee, right? And, and, and it's, you almost, if, if, if Andrew said, well, I, because I, there's, a, it's almost as if, I mean, it is. Jesus is showing us the different disciples' reactions. Philip just goes, I made the calculation, nothing. Andrew, I'll, I'm going to, I'll at least try, but just to, and, and he finds some. And if he just said to Jesus, I've got some loaves of bread and fish, boy, that would have looked like he's saying, I know you're here. Maybe you can do something with this. But he, 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 he keeps talking, right? And we read that verse 9, there is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are these for so many people? And Jesus says, sit down. I want you all to sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. Jesus then, in verse 11, took the loaves, and having given thanks, he distributed to those who were seated. Likewise, also of the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments so that nothing will be lost. It's, 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 Jesus involves them, right? Because he's now made it clear to them, they'll never forget what an impossible situation it was. And now he takes the bread and the fish. And somehow, and maybe there are other teachers or preachers who have just been far more creative. And somehow, I don't, I don't know where the miracle was taking place. I don't know if it was taking place in the baskets, you know, that they were carrying around. I don't know if it was taking place literally at the, at the, at the, the just the initial loaves and fish themselves just kept being reproduced, right? But we have this amazing miracle of multiplication, not division. Our deacons before have performed a miracle of division here. Maybe you don't realize it, but there have been times 
during communion, when they get, and one of the, they're running out of communion, that our deacons begin to divide the communion to make sure, and they'll be in the back breaking it into smaller pieces so that everybody gets one. That's division, <laughs> right? Uh, this past Sunday was, I, I loved it. They were nice. Somebody even joked with me on the Sunday, on the Sunday that I talked about how few calories, we had a nice healthy portion for <laughs> communion, right? You know. But, but, but uh, you know, because I, there have been times where the deacons have literally come to the front and almost having to go like this. You know, I think I got some here, right? But, but, but it, it, it's, it, 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 that's breaking things in pieces. This was a miracle of multiplying. And so much, so that what? They ate as much as they wanted. They were all full in verse 12. When they were filled, he says to the disciples, this is for you. This miracle is for your sake. Go out there and gather up the leftovers. You know, if I'm with somebody who can multiply that much, why are we worried about leftovers, right? Who needs leftovers? If, if, if I'm with a Savior who can multiply a few loaves of bread and fish to feed everybody. Let the birds enjoy it or whatever. Let, let, forget it. Who, who's worried about picking up the leftovers? Jesus didn't need them. It is, it, I mean, it is so clear how personally this is supposed to impact them. So in verse 13, they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves, which were left over by those who had eaten. They had, each one of them, had their own full basket. And to, 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 to kind of, just, every one of them, Bartholomew, and just walking. Look at this. Each one of them was carrying a full basket, which told them what was absolutely impossible for all of us put together. What was impossible was not impossible for him. It was possible for him. Our impossibilities are real, but they're not impossible for him. And Jesus wanted that in their hands. A few weeks ago, I um, was at a wedding reception and was seated with somebody that I haven't seen since high school. And I went through, you know, Catholic school with her across the street. And we were talking memories and sharing memories. And, and she, was, she was saying, she said, you know what? Oh, I, I just, that was, oh, I just, I, it's hard to, you know, what we had, you know, because, you know, it was a small school and you went to, for most of the kids in my class, you spent eight years together there in, in, in school. And she said, boy, that, I just look back at that and how, how our memories, she says, I remember eighth grade when Mr. Fitz Gave us all dimes. He had written a poem. Mr. Fitz was our eighth grade teacher. And I, he must have, uh, I've said before, I think he, he went to bed every night watching To Sir With Love with Sidney Portier Because he was, it, it was all, he was, he was doing everything. Instead of keeping discipline in the, he, I mean, he was doing everything he could to, to build this, this bond with us. And, and, you know, while in the other religion class, the nuns were teaching them real religion, we were sitting on the floor listening to Cat Stevens singing Moonshadow. And, like, it was, it was just a whole, you know, it was, it was the, the, the 70s, right? And, and he was trying. And he gave us all a dime. Because the phone call was a dime back then. And, and he gave us a dime. We could call him at any time. And, and as I'm talking to this girl, she's saying, I still have that dime. I still hold on to that dime. I, and when I look at it sometimes, it reminds me. And she said, do you still have that dime? And I said, no, actually, the day, the day that he gave it to us, I bought two soft pretzels because they, they were a nickel apiece. Right? <laughs> you know, he had it taped onto the poem, and I, I'm not sure what happened to the poem, but I tore the dime off, and I got two soft pretzels. But I mean, and she, but she's saying, oh, to hold that dime. She says, I look at it, and it, to, to, to disciples holding that. And I don't know 
if you have a basket like that, figuratively, in your life, you were facing something that was impossible. I know all of us do, at least in one regard. You were facing the impossibility of eternal life, the impossibility of the forgiveness of your sins. And I stress that because sometimes I think folks can move by it to say, uh, yeah, I need you, I need you, Savior, boom. And, 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 but that impossibility, I have no possibility. If you say, God's never, God's never done anything for me that was, you know, I've never seen him work in any of my impossibilities. Whew. There is no greater impossibility. There, there, is, there is nothing more impossible than a sinful human being getting to be in the presence of Almighty God. Nothing. And yet, what was impossible for us, He made possible through Christ, and we are covered in His righteousness, right? But, but other things in life, listen, I don't know what you're facing. I don't know. I don't know if it's this is impossible. Um, I, I, this is an impossible financial hill I'm facing, or this is an impossible relational, you know, river to cross. Or I don't, I don't know what it is. What's impossible? And, but I know this: God brings us to those moments to say, "Lord, I acknowledge, I, this is, I, I, I don't have the possible. I, I don't have the means of doing this, but you do. With God, nothing is impossible." And he brings us there for us to see that once God has spoken, twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are our great God. Some of these prayer requests, Lord, we look at and, and they can seem uh, just overwhelming. But we continue to beseech you because we know there is nothing, no Absolutely nothing too difficult for you. So encourage us with that, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.